Well, hello, people. This is Pastor Chris Quimby of Harmony Bible Church. I want to welcome you to this week's episode of the midweek online Bible study. Seems weird to call it an episode like it's a show, but in these weird times when we're doing a lot of things technologically, us in the ministry, to try to keep people away from each other and keep people a little more safe, then you know, it feels a little bit like a show. I'm happy that I got a nice little setup here. We recently had some work done at the house. Um, not for this purpose, but it's a nice place for me to deliver these from. So I'm comfortable here and I'm thankful that God has allowed us uh, to, to have a little space like this at the house um, where I can just sip some coffee and have my Bible open and get into it with you. So again, midweek online Bible study sponsored by Camden National Bank. Not really. Uh, it's just the cup that I have. But anyway, enough goofiness. Uh, we do this each week, and what we've been doing is going through the prayers of the Bible. We probably won't hit every one of them, but there are a, a resource of a hundred of them from a book that I have. And it seemed like a good idea as we each endeavor to better understand God through this process, to be encouraged to be actively in prayer in our own lives. And as we learn more about God, we learn better how to do all kinds of things as those who follow Him. Um, but importantly, we, we learn how to pray. Uh, if, we, if we learn, for example, that uh, God is always present, uh, we know that we can always pray to Him. We don't take for granted uh, as much little things like the fact that we don't need to make an appointment with Him. Uh, we can't exhaust His energies or attention. So as we learn more and enrich our theology through studying um, both these prayers and then your other independent studies of the Bible that you do, we learn better how to relate to God. And one of those ways that we relate to God is through prayer. It's often said uh, that we hear from God through His Word and we respond to God in a, in a matter of communication. We respond to God by prayer. So we will get into his word so that we might hear from God and that that in turn might enrich the way that we communicate with God. Last week we were in Jonah. Don't get that confused with Job. They both start with the, the same first two letters, J-O, but and it's one of those things that I can easily get confused in my own mind. But we're not in Jonah like we were last week. We are in the book of Job and that's part of the uh, what's called the wisdom literature. In the Bible. Maybe you don't know the way the books are all grouped together, but in the Old Testament, one section of it is wisdom literature. You have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song, and Solomon. So, a good, easy way to find Job is if you always pretty much flip to the middle of your Bible and then go a little bit to the left, you'll find Job. Usually, Psalms is around the middle ish, and it's a rather big book of the Bible. So, if you go right to the left of that, you'll find Job. And we're going to be right at the end of the book of Job in chapter 42, which is the last chapter of Job. So it's not a small book in and of itself with 42 chapters, but we're only going to be concentrating on six verses in it. Those are the first six verses of chapter 42. So Job chapter 42 verses 1 through 6. And most of us are familiar with the book. We understand that uh, Job, with the allowance of God, was tested, severe understatement, uh, by Satan. And every, most everything that would matter to him under the sun, so most everything that mattered to him in this world was taken from him. And he was suffering physically as well, emotionally and all. The, he had a bad life. He was a pity, pitiful figure. Uh, he's visited by three friends who... Um, are good in the sense that they just sit with him for quite a while, which is always a great thing to do with somebody who's suffering. Uh, try to keep your words to a minimum, because likely what's going to come out will not be helpful and might seem glib. Um, but then they they tried to help him process things in a way that uh, they felt was meaningful and responsible, but mm, wasn't so much. Uh, Job then, after an admirable first position in maintaining his his love and devotion love of and devotion to god at the beginning of all of this ends up near the end questioning uh, 
God and then God answers and God really puts him in his place. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Lord of the Rings movies. I feel like I quote them a lot. And, and just forgive me if this is not the best example. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to use a, a, an example for a movie and have you misunderstand what the character of God is. But it reminds me of the time in the Fellowship of the Ring when uh, Bilbo Baggins is just having this little chatter fest back and forth with Gandalf in his apartment about the ring. And then Gandalf finally just like throws the gauntlet down and says, Bilbo Baggins, I am not trying to uh, harm you or something to that effect. I am trying to help you. Like, and it just, the force of his words uh, is imposing to Bilbo. And that's, that's how I picture with all of the unsteadiness of the rhetoric that's coming from the friends and that's coming from Job toward God, God finally just saying like, all right, Here's what it is, and then telling Job straight some things that really establish the enormity and inscrutability of God against the questions of a mortal man, such as Job. So we find ourselves in chapter 42 after that with Job in a simple six-verse prayer here uh, of confession and repentance toward God. So let's read that, and then we'll discuss a few things about it. So chapter 42, the first six verses say, God's word says, And then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That is the balance of the prayer from God's Word. Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Now, let's talk about a few things in it. At the very beginning, it says, And then Job answered the Lord and said, So we know who's praying, and we know who he's praying to. Also, that's, you know, that's not a given. In many of these occasions, when we've been through the prayers of the Bible, it's notable who is being prayed to. Now, if you've grown up in church, and used to, you're used to just the idea of throwing the word prayer around, let's pray, um, it's probably safe in, in a Christian context for you to make an assumption about who we're praying to. The God of heaven, God the Father um, of the Trinity, uh, praying through Christ the Son, um, by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've seen these examples throughout Scripture. But not everybody that prays, okay, not everybody in the world prays to the capital G God that those who are in the Christian community, who are in the kingdom of God, pray to. You know, there are various other religions out there. There are misunderstandings about who God is. Uh, we, we know from, so we're in Job now, but Jonah, uh, not last week's prayer from Jonah, but uh, the other prayer that, that we had been in a few weeks prior from Jonah's shipmates, they worshipped other gods, and they had offered prayers up to those other gods before they ended up uh, offering up an effective prayer to Jehovah, the God that uh, we Christians serve. So, no small thing could seem like a throwaway verse to us, but it's no small thing to know that Job answered the Lord. Uh, and as Bill taught us in the Sunday school, that word Lord isn't just a designation of someone who's in authority over you per se. It's all capitalized in my Bible, in the ESV, and likely in yours too. That, Whenever that is the case, that means it's referring to the God that Christians acknowledge, fear, obey, serve, pray to, etc. So we continue into the prayer in verse 2. Jonah says, Excuse, uh, see, I told you that's an issue for me. Uh, Job says to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So, Jonah is, 
as we said, this is a prayer of confession and repentance. Jonah is confessing the truth. He is rejoicing with the truth in after all of what's transpired, finally conceding to say to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now, is that a throwaway thing? We would say uh, our, our stated theology within Christianity would be such that we would admit that too. But our practical theology, the way that we live out our lives, do you sense occasions in your life where either when you're in periods of discouragement or despair, uh, isn't it hard to believe in the power of God if you are not effectively seeing evidences of it in the way that you want to see them, which very much would have been part of Job's challenge in suffering. Have you been through things like this in your life? Where, and I'm not trying to equate any of our lives with that of Job. We know we have people in our circle and whatnot who, who can't seem to catch a break, who seem to um, have their misfortune be met with more misfortune. Uh, and, and those are, honestly, those are perplexing things to deal with. We naturally, as people, we have questions about those things. Um, but not even to the degree that somebody who's living in those sufferings would have. Picture a man like Job here who, you know, probably after the fourth or fifth challenge that he faces is just waiting for things for the pendulum to swing and for things to start to go quote, quote unquote his way for there uh, to start to be some solutions in the midst of all of these problems but he's just whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked over and over again that would be hard in that circumstance for the, you to maintain a conviction that God is um, that God can do all things and that no purpose of his can be thwarted but at the end of all this God excuse me um Job is confessing the reality of that to God, that, n that he can do all things and that no purpose of God's can be thwarted. He continues on and says, well, actually, let me say one more thing about this, because in my studies it was brought up the, uh, the idea of omnipresence, the idea that we would subscribe to in biblical Christianity, in evangelical Christianity, that God is everywhere. And um, it's important to make the distinction that uh, because when we tend to think of God being everywhere, we tend to think of him in terms of people uh, or things that have a body um, and that God can be like in Brooks, where I am right now, but also in South Thomaston simultaneously and in China and, and various other places, which, which is true in the sense, but it's more helpful to think of God um, to, for for. God as another dimension in the sense that he's always everywhere, but not in the sense in which we think of people being places and that we can be in fellowship with or outside of fellowship with God to the degree that we fear him and obey his commandments, um, that he's always there, but not in this. I don't know that I'm doing this any justice in the way that I'm trying to describe it. Um, but... Uh, that's a that's a, that's a that's a Christian doctrine that's a, a fun thing to think about the reality um, such that um, conversely rather than us being comforted by the idea that God is always around and that we can have greater fellowship with him to the degree that we do obey his commandments and abide in him contrasting that is this idea that when we are in sin and you know, sin will often like tempt you, and then if you pursue that temptation, it can grab you, and then it does what what I've described as um, it wants to drag you off in a corner, out of fellowship with God and out of fellowship with other people. It wants to um, identify experientially to you the problem that you are facing because of sin, but it in turn deceives you and offers itself as the solution to that problem that it causes, which is just this self-perpetuating loop which just holds you further and further down into darkness um, and we can fall into that if just like it all started with the first two people Adam and Eve who tried to hide from God as if such a thing was possible David speaks of that in Psalm 139 when he expresses the 
logical implausibility of doing such a thing when he says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? He says to God, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, like Jonah did, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That last example about being in the uttermost parts of the sea, what a timely thing for us to concentrate on where we did talk about this prayer of Jonah last week and the fact that, thank praise God, that he was there because he was able to answer that prayer from Jonah while he was in the belly of the fish. But bringing it back to Job here, I'm really tempting myself to mess up that uh, comparison with Jonah and Job as I keep bringing him up. But uh, back to the prayer of Job here. So he's talking about the idea that, that God is all-powerful. Uh, along with that is the idea that God is everywhere and he cannot be run from. In verse 3, he continues this prayer. So Job 42, 3, he says, Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, wonderful for me, which I did not know. It's useful for us to know that that's a quote. Um, he's quoting God in that. When he says, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? If you have a paper Bible or a, a digital Bible before you as, as you go through this, I know if it's digital, you might lose me if you're watching this on YouTube, but... Um, Consider going back to Job, uh, the same book, but chapter 38 and verse 2. You'll see that God, here I'll go back there for you to set a good example. Uh, Job 38 verse 2, God says to Job, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? So God asked that question rhetorically to God, like basically saying, Who are you? to question me. So Job is making reference back to that and quoting God back to him in saying in verse 3 of, of chapter 42, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? And then, and then Job says, therefore, he's admitting and confessing that I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. He's, he's um, beep, 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 as we say, the, the truck's backing up. He's um, He's, he's, he's confessing and repenting upon that questioning heart attitude that he had toward God and basically saying, yeah, I get it. Uh, you're God. How dare I have this sort of critical mentality toward you as I have demonstrated so far? Continuing on in, in Job's prayer 42 verse 4. He says, here, so he says this to God, here, I and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. Okay, again, Job is going back and citing something else that God had said. And if you're, I, again, in 38.3, so we, I just had you go back to Job 38.2. This would just be the following verse after that, Job 38.3, which I'll go back and read where God says to Job, dress for action like a man, I will question you, and you make it known to me. Okay, so that's what God, uh, that's what uh, Job is citing in this the prayer that we're studying this morning. I will question you. He says, "Here and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me." God said that very same thing also in just a little bit earlier in in chapter forty, verse seven. Let's read that chapter forty, verse seven. God says, as He challenges Job. Again, the very same thing. Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Basically, I got a bunch of questions for you. What you got? You got what you got for answers to this? And and God asks such thing. He goes on this laundry list. Um, the wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they, I'm reading from uh, from uh, chapter thirty nine. But there's plenty of good material here to pick from. Um, the beginning of chapter thirty nine. Do you know when the mountains, when the mountain goat gives birth? Do you observe the calving of the, uh, the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth? When they crouch, bring forth their offspring, and are delivered of the young. Their young ones become strong. They grow up into the open. They go out and they do not return to them. He asks all of these different questions of the different things that God manages in such a way that it's no big whoop to God, but it's a big whoop 
to a finite person such as Job. So God is establishing his godness in light of Job's critique of him and the critique and bad theology of his friends. So that's we're through verse 4. Uh, continuing on into verse 5, I had heard of you, he's saying, this is Job saying to God, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Okay, so it's kind of a metaphorical way of saying, I knew you, God, but now I know, know you. Now, recently, uh, particularly in these online Bible studies, I've talked about, because it's come out in Scripture, this idea of knowing God more. Part of this comes from prayers that Paul has offered on behalf of the Christian church in the book of Ephesians, but much elsewhere in Scripture. This idea of the distinction of the, of the distinction between knowing stuff about God and knowing God. Um, I have a, a friend, a pastor friend of mine, who uh, was fortunate to have a seminary education, which I, I've taken a few classes in seminary, but I don't have a seminary degree. And he has said, and I've seen it confirmed elsewhere um, from those who are qualified to give that testimony, that it's quite possible and unfortunately somewhat likely that you could leave a seminary and know an awful lot about God, but not necessarily know God. Or that you might be puffed up with your own knowledge to the degree that you account academic information as a substitute for experiential knowledge of God. Job here is essentially saying, you know, I had my idea of what you were before this, but because of this trial, because of your response in the midst of this trial, now I know, know you. Um, And I want to say what I'm going to say here carefully and honestly, at the, uh, gently, (laughs) for fear that I might have to follow my own advice here. Um, These troubles that we go through in life, now again, very few of us by God's grace, we'll have to encounter the the kinds of trials that Job went through. But trials of, of much less consequence still hurt. The things we go through are still difficult to go through. For those who are in the Lord, praise the Lord that you don't have to go through those alone, that you can go through those with the Lord. And think about Job's experience here, where are you with me? Can you grant me the likelihood that if Job had not gone through the loss and pain that he went through, that he might not have been down in the basement, down in the, the gritty floor of all of these questions about God that he was wrestling with, and if he didn't, if he didn't abide there and bring these things to God, he probably would not have heard from God with the force and the impact that he did and might have missed an opportunity to know, know God. I say that as an encouragement to those of us who are going through perplexing things which seem to have no immediate answer, that just seem to be a vain journey through difficulty. Please, first of all, my heart goes out to you and I'm sorry that you suffer. Uh, You know, life stinks. You think that's not a pastoral thing to say? Let Join us as we go through Ecclesiastes here for the next few months. There's a lot in life that's difficult. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Life is hard. And I'm very sorry for when my brothers and sisters suffer. Please consider it to be some encouragement that in the wrestling and the challenge that you currently abide in, 
you, if you lean into God during that, might have the advantage of knowing him, of his salvation, his provision, of his comfort, his peace that passes all understanding in a way that uh, others who are insulated from pain by either um, much money, much health, much friendships, whatever. Read the Beatitudes. There's, there's much gain that can be found in a poverty in certain areas of your life that those who don't have that same poverty are distanced from. That's a hard teaching. I believe it to be an accurate teaching, and I hope it's an encouragement to you who are suffering and for any of us when we do suffer. So in verse 5 where we were, again, Job had said, I had heard of you um, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I get it. I get it. Now, he's, he doesn't have a complete knowledge of God, but he's got more of an understanding of who God is than he did uh, at, at the beginning of all of this episode that he finds himself in. And then the last verse for, for, this, for this prayer, um, verse 6, he says, Therefore I despise myself uh, and repent in dust in ashes. Uh, I despise myself. Does that talk about, does that um, illustrate the idea that, that he hates himself? I know generally the context in our culture that we would use the word despise in would tend to be like somebody that you really hate a lot. You have a lot of really negative feelings for that person. You might say, well, I despise them. You don't just not like them. You don't just maybe even hate them. You despise them. It sounds so wicked, right? Um, But as we did when we, um, oh, I don't remember when we were in this verse. We talked about how Christ, um, in his relationship to the cross, despising the shame, that phrase, despising the shame, um, isn't so much a hate, it's, it's, a, it's a pushing away from, distancing himself from the shame of it. And it's also responsible for understanding this translation to be like d- moving, rejecting. Uh, Job saying, I reject myself. Basically, if, if Job was uh, able to move away from the the personal aspect of his engagement with God and, and almost make himself a third party so that he's, he's able to look on this dialogue, um, this antagonistic dialogue between himself and God. Uh, if he was in the jury, as it were, looking upon these two um, arguments of the plaintiff and the defendant, he's basically saying, oh yeah, I've moved away from my alignment with that strain of rhetoric. I I, I no longer, um, I no longer side with the Job guy, and here he is, Job. Now, now we—that's a little bit of a trippy way to think of it. The fact that you're going to move outside of yourself to critique yourself, but dude, that's the whole Christian life. I mean, so many times I come home, and my wife and I have these conversations, and I'll confess, like, I got to tell you. I felt this way about this person, about this situation. I was was thinking this. I had incomplete information and I was forming all these conclusions which made me feel this way. But I rejected that. I recognized that those were carnal feelings, that those were of my flesh. They were very selfishly motivated. They were not the product of godly love. So I rejected. I despised those feelings and I aligned myself with what I know from God's word. And that's the kind of preaching to ourselves that those of us who want to grow in the Lord need to be engaged in all the time. Don't believe yourself. Question yourself. Especially your first impulses. Job here is doing that. He's saying in verse 6, Therefore I despise myself. I I reject myself. Um, Recalling all of his former opinions and the things that he offered up to God. Some of us do this. And some of us who are adults, maybe in our 40s or 50s, I think it's all the more probable that you've done this if you've had the pleasure and the challenge of raising your own children. You've thought back to what kind of a child you were in regards to authority, whether it be parents, pastors, coaches, teachers, whatever the case might be. And you might despise yourself when you think back to your weak-minded, immature, and selfish posture that you had during those times. 
Job is thinking back upon earlier in this dialogue with God of the weak-minded, selfish posture that he had towards God, saying, Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, that sounds really dirty, uh, literally really dirty. And most of us know that in that culture at that time, that was a physical way of expressing your either your mourning or um, or humility over something. Um, and we're we're familiar with uh, you know we don't do that in our culture, but I can't think of a good example for it, but. Um, Job was authentically put in his place by God throughout all of this. And that ends up the book with the Lord after that rebuking Job's friends and then happy ending to the story, restoring Job's fortunes. So uh, what, what's a takeaway from this? Um, please understand that your walk with God is a journey. That my walk with God is a journey. We, we don't see in full now like we will one day. We suffer things and have questions as to why we suffer. Sometimes we operate on bad theology, bad understandings of God, and we assume that every time we suffer, it's a punishment for something that we've done wrong or something right that we haven't done. That's not true. Now, it might be true. There might be a measure of truth to it because God does, does discipline those who he loves. Disciplines. It's not punitive. God's, God's not looking to take... God does not take joy in punishing like an abusive parent. Okay, Christ bore the punishment for our sin. There is punishment and wrath for sin. And for those who are in Christ, and that's a great selling point for being in Christ, is that Christ took the punishment and the wrath for your sin. Now, God wants you, as any good parent would, to grow up to be what He sent His Son to die for you to be free to be. So there will be disciplining. For a Christian, there should be self-disciplining. We need to move away from this idea of discipline necessarily being a pejorative word, being something that we're afraid of. And I don't like discipline either, I'll admit that. But discipline without purpose, just vain, isolated discipline is a contemptible thing. But the discipline of the Lord that would grow you up further into Christ-likeness and to fruitfulness is a good thing. So we can take away from the idea that... Um, when you do suffer, it, it might be that God is disciplining you. It might be that God is pruning you like you would a plant, trimming off things that um, expend, wastefully expend resources so that you might be more lean and mean, so to speak, more efficient, more fruitful like a plant. Now, we might uh, operate on bad theology if when things go well, and I admit I fall into this sometimes, I'm in a season of my life where a lot of the things that have caused me anxiety over the past few years are going quite nicely. And I catch myself once in a while saying, I bet that's because, and then some, uh, I say this to my own embarrassment, but some quality of myself that I hold in high regard. Uh, and then immediately, again, I have to back off and say, I despise myself for that thought. That's bad theology, and it shows an incomplete understanding of who I actually am. It's giving myself much more credit for being good or competent uh, than I should. I need to, in all ways, whether going through suffering or going through periods of, of ease, and like Ecclesiastes will say, there are seasons in our life which will contain hardship, and which will contain ease and so many other things. Don't make too much of those and attach too many of those to the idea that you deserve one or the other. But in those, wrestle with God. Seek Him in His Word. Uh, offer authentic, sincere prayers to Him. Uh, God's got big enough shoulders to stand up for Himself. So come to Him in authenticity. Uh, I would say if you're questioning, if you're upset, ask questions of God. 
pray with the force of someone who is upset. Respectful, yes. Don't be disrespectful to God, but don't fake like he doesn't already know what's in your heart anyway, okay? So, in all ways, you, let's use these experiences that we might come to know God better, to not just know him, to not just, as, as Job says, having heard of him by the hearing of the ear, but to open our eyes so our eyes see him, so we know, know him. My small hope for this day is that just from this brief uh, 37 or 8 minute time in his word, that you would be encouraged to grow and to know him more, whether you're at a time of plenty in your life or whether you're at a time of poverty or or difficulty in your life. Um, Thank you for joining me. In God's Word, I've enjoyed doing this, and um, you, you have my wishes for fruitfulness and a growth in a knowledge of God uh, that you might, in His omnipresence, always be able to tap into that fellowship with Him, uh, which is uh, the great way of of enjoying that abundant and eternal life that he offers us even now on this side of the grave. Thank you, friends. Have a wonderful week.